<clears throat> I think I've shared this before, but <clears throat> when I, after the Lord changed my heart at around 18, at the age of 18, I can remember going to church services and sometimes uh, they would have these song services where there would be a hymn that you could choose and you just raise your hand and uh, you could tell the, the worship leader what hymn you wanted and that's what we would do. And I can remember in those days, that hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, was a hymn I always raised my hand and cited. And uh, we began our service that way this morning. And I hope for you that it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. And if you don't know what it is to trust in Christ, that you would cry out to the Lord today. He's brought you here. He's brought you among the people of God. He's brought you underneath uh, the teaching of God's word and among the praises of God's people. He has been merciful to you today, if you're not a Christian, in bringing you here. So seek the Lord, even as you sit there this morning, seek the Lord and ask that he would open up your eyes and he would show you his glory through the songs, through the prayers, through the preaching, through watching the Lord's Supper unfold that you would come to know this Christ and that from the heart you would be able to sing it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. At this point in our service, we come to study God's word together and today we are in Exodus chapter 16. So if you'll go ahead and go there in your Bibles, Exodus 16 verses 1 to 15. It may seem strange uh, to cut uh, in the middle of the passage in the in, in verse 15, it may seem strange there just in terms of how the passage unfolds. And also, right in the middle of what Moses is saying, the reason I have cut at verse 15 is because you notice a structure beginning in verse 16 where Moses will say repeatedly, this is what the Lord has commanded. And so those words, this is what the Lord has commanded, becomes the macro structure for what we find from verses 16 all the way to the end of chapter 16. And so I think it is fitting to cut at verse 15. So that's where we are today in these first 15 verses of Exodus 16. And as we are moving through the book of Exodus, today we return to the wilderness with the Israelites. So we are in the wilderness with the Israelites after they have been brought out of Egypt. We are uh, seeing God's dealings with his people. And we're getting an understanding for how God deals with us, how he relates to us, how he shepherds us through this life. And, and make no mistake, if you're a believer this morning, God is actively shepherding you. You may uh, feel as though God is absent right now. Or you can remember, you look back at a time in your life, you say, oh, I know God was there then. I know God was present at that time. But maybe this is a season where God just doesn't feel very there. And just know that God is always there for his people. Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. And the Holy Spirit, it dwells within us. He has made us God's temple. And so if you are a believer here this morning, regardless of how you feel, regardless of how you interpret or misinterpret God's providence, know that he is present. He is shepherding you as one of his people. And he was shepherding his people Israel as he brought them through the wilderness. They have come through the Red Sea and they are on their way to Mount Sinai. That's, that's really where the narrative is leading. It's taking us from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. And they are on their way there where God will give them his law. God will give them his law and that will constitute a covenant between the nation of Israel, no longer just a people, no longer, no longer just a family even before that, but this is the nation of Israel as they will be constituted covenantally as God's people with his law. He will give them his oracles. He will give them his law. He will put it before them as their great meditation day and night, as Psalm 1 says. And as, as the Lord commands Joshua, it, it is to be before him always, meditating on it day and night. The Lord is moving the people towards Sinai. But what we see here in these passages is that the Lord is already working to give his people 
an understanding of the fundamentals of his law. It's really interesting when you read through these, these narratives leading up to Mount Sinai. It's interesting to see that God is preparing his people for this large revelation of his law. He's giving him these little bits of preparation. The fundamentals of his law. God's people are to trust and obey. The, the fundamentals of his law, to trust him as their God. The problem with idolatry, most fundamentally, is that it evidences a lack of trust in God. You don't trust God, so you turn your trust, you turn your dependence away from the Lord to other gods, because those other gods will do for you what the Lord can't or won't. So at the heart of idolatry is a lack of trust, a lack of dependence on the Lord and obedience to the Lord. They are to depend on him and to follow his instructions. What the Lord says to do, God's people are to do. This is what it truly means to call him Lord. To not do what the Lord says is to erase him as Lord. It is to substitute some other kind of intrinsic title for God. It is to dethrone him, as it were, in your own life, in your own heart. It is to say, I can say whatever I will about the Lord, but he's not really who I say he is. Obedience to the Lord is the confession of him as the great and sovereign king. It is to listen to his word. Last week we saw an early test. A test involving thirst. The Israelites travel for three days into the wilderness and they find no water. Three days, their water supplies are running out. We don't know how much they have in reserve. We don't know to what extent. Maybe pockets are Totally out. Maybe some still have a little bit of water. But they go three days into the wilderness and find no water. Then, when they finally do find water, and you can only imagine what it would be like for 2 to 2.5 million people coming up and being told as the news goes back along the lines that there's water ahead, there's water ahead, there's water ahead. You can imagine the great disappointment when they find out that this water source is too contaminated, it is bitter, they are unable to drink. So we can imagine the depth of their disappointment. It is really easy to look back on the Israelites in the wilderness and just sort of poke at them and point at them and, and, and tear them down. But what we understand is that we do the same thing they do or they did. We understand with empathy in our own situations what it would have been like for them to have no water and then to find water that doesn't cut it. Their response is grumbling to Moses. That's how they respond to this situation of thirst. Moses' response is prayer to Yahweh. And Yahweh's response is gracious provision for the people. The Lord graciously and patiently provides for his people. He does not destroy them. He does not punish them. He does not judge them in this instance. He, he patiently and graciously provides for their needs. He instructs Moses to throw part of a tree into the water, and the, tree is tr and, and the water is transformed from bitter, undrinkable water to sweet and drinkable and what we saw last week is that this is an opportunity for the Lord to instruct his people on the importance of hearing and heeding his word. And it also offers an illustration. If they heed his word, they, they listen and do it, then they will be like this sweet water. But if they do not obey the Lord, they will be like the bitter water. And they will be like the Egyptians under the plagues. And so we read in verse 26, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. And we talked about last week how 
Uh, That is what Paul makes so perfectly clear in Romans, is that none of us keeps the law like that. Right? That's the only way to be saved by law keeping, is if it is perfect. Well, of course, it's not perfect. It's never perfect. We do not keep the law like that, but one did. And isn't it amazing to us as we consider the glory of Christ that what I just read actually applies to Jesus Christ? That Christ diligently listened to the voice of the Lord in his human nature as as God and man, one person, two natures, Christ diligently listened. He meditated day and night. I think Psalm 1 is fulfilled in Christ as we think about Christ being the fulfillment of all of that. He did that which was right in his eyes. He gave ear to his commandments, kept all his statutes. Christ did what we cannot do. And through Christ's perfect law keeping and through Christ's sacrificial death, we become in Christ righteous We become God's righteousness in Christ. And from the heart, by God's grace, by the power of the Spirit, we begin to actually do this. Isn't that amazing? That we actually begin to diligently listen to the voice of the Lord. We do that which is right in His eyes. We give ear to His commandments. We keep His statutes. Why? Because the life of Christ is in us. And so even as we come to this little pointer to the law, we see the grace of God in giving the law and in showing the people that they could not keep the law and they needed the Christ. They needed the Redeemer. But as we think about God's grace and His patience, finally, last week, we came to this oasis. God brings them after this trial, after this test of thirst, three days and then water, That was undrinkable. God brings them to an oasis. And not just any oasis, but interestingly, one with 12 springs and 70 palm trees. And as I said last week, some want to say there's no significance to these numbers. I think that's pretty silly. Others want to sort of maybe overinflate the significance of these numbers. But I think at the very least, we are meant to understand that the 12 springs represent the 12 tribes. And it reminded the people that God had been faithful over all of these centuries to be with his people and to grow them, to multiply them, to turn them into a nation. 12 springs and then 70 palm trees, perhaps pointing to the 70 who entered into Egypt with Jacob. Jacob was a band of 70 As we think about Exodus chapter 1. So we see God's grace and his patience. Today as we move into chapter 16. We go from thirst to hunger. Last week the people were running out of water. And this week they are running out of food. And this shows us I think that God walks his people into various kinds of tests and trying circumstances. Think about this. Last week it was drink, and this week it is food. And it reminds us that in in life, God brings us into all kinds of circumstances, all sorts of difficult situations, maybe financial situations, situations with relationships, situations with health, many different kinds of trials we face. And I think that's why James in James chapter 1 uses such general language as various kinds of trials, all sorts of things that could happen to us. <clears throat> God walks his people into all kinds of trying circumstances. And when he does so, we should not be surprise. This is how God works with his people. And maybe when you became a Christian, maybe you're a baby Christian and and the way in which you became a Christian or what you learned as you came into the faith, you you just weren't taught these sorts of things. You know, prosperity gospel theology just infuses itself into all of Christianity. And so maybe you just did not as it were, sign up for. You you weren't thinking about the fact that God was going to actually lead you into all sorts of difficult situations, into all sorts of trying circumstances. You cannot read the Bible 
and miss the fact that that's how God works with his people. And it's encouraging to us because it, it, it lets us know this morning that we can just sort, sort of take a big sigh, we can, we can breathe deep, and we can know, okay, this is, this is the way it is. And, and that's okay. That's okay. To breathe out contentment, to breathe out joy in the midst of whatever it is, the Lord is bringing you into. And think about that. The Lord has brought you into this. Wherever you are this morning, maybe, you know, this is a, a, a room of people. There, there are people this morning who probably are, as Michael prayed earlier, probably are in, in the depths, right? People here this morning who feel entirely overwhelmed. Now, understand this. The Lord has brought you here in his providence. This is not an accident. It's not like, oops, God messed up. The Lord has brought us here, and I think there are at least three major things that comfort us as we think about what we're, what we're reading in Exodus. First is that God walks, these aren't our points for this morning, by the way, so uh, you don't need to write them down for that purpose. So first, he walks with us. We don't, we, God doesn't walk us into adverse circumstances, into trying circumstances, and then leave us there. He walks with us, and we see that with the Israelites. Secondly, he is patient with our failings. I mean, how many times in these adverse circumstances do we fail the Lord? So often, we look to idols, or we, we grumble, or we, we treat others poorly. We don't give God thanks, just fill in the blank. And, and here's what we're seeing, is that God is patient with our failings, In these circumstances, he doesn't smite us. Now, he does discipline us. And we need to recognize the seriousness of that. But he is patient with our failings. And finally, he is leading us to the promised land. As you're watching this thing happen with the Israelites, you're watching all uh, these adverse circumstances, we need to remember where they're headed. They're headed towards a place of, of peace. They're headed towards the promised land. Land, the place of rest. So God walks us into these things. He's with us in them. He's patient with us through them. He grows us through them and is leading us to a place of perfect rest. As we think about the hunger this morning of the Israelites in the wilderness, the title for the sermon is Hungry Protest and Heavenly Provision. So if you would go ahead and stand with me for this Reading of God's word, we're going to read Exodus 16, verses 1 to 15. Hungry protest and heavenly provision. This is the word of God. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I think you have to insert that there. (laughs) Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. We see the importance of God testing his people there whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the morning, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against 
the Lord. Just notice how many times the word grumbling is repeated in this passage. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. I think of frosted flakes, but that's probably not quite (laughs) what it looked like, but that's what I think about. Verse 15, when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread of that the Lord has given you to eat. And we'll go ahead and stop there. You can be seated because we begin in verse 16 with these words. This is what the Lord has commanded. And that, as I said, occurs three times. And the emphasis in the latter part of this chapter is on the testing nature of this and the obedience of the people in following the instructions that God gives associated with the provision of the food. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask for his blessing as we come to study his word together. Father, we thank you for the scriptures, how they have fed your people for centuries, Lord, for millennia. We thank you for the fact that your word is timeless in the sense that it transcends all the different epochs of time and and circumstances. Lord, it speaks to each of us. It is a living word. It speaks to our hearts. And Lord, it's amazing even after services, talking with people, just to see the the different ways that you take the scriptures and you apply them to our lives. And and different things fall on each of us with a, a different level of weight given our lives. And Father, we thank you for this very personal and intimate work and a demonstration that you are present with us. Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who feels as though you are not there. Uh, who knows intellectually uh, by, uh, through their thinking and who knows by faith in their hearts as they are saved that you are there and yet they feel otherwise and they are tempted to think otherwise. Lord, would you comfort them this morning with your shepherding care? Would they walk away from this service knowing that you may have walked them into a great trial but that you are walking through it with them and you are leading them home. Father, would you comfort us, all of us, with those truths, Lord? And and Lord, would you bring discipline to us, even through the sermon, as we think about our own grumbling and complaining? We, We praise you, Father, that you are merciful with us. You're patient with us in our grumbling, Lord, but we know that you call us away from this. And so we ask this morning that you would work to call us away from this definitively this morning, Lord, that we would, that we would turn, if we have a pattern in our lives of grumbling, that we would turn from that and walk in the way of Christ by the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this time together with brothers and sisters uh, before the face of our Heavenly Father in the name and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, our elder brother, our King. We thank you for him. We thank you that he kept your law perfectly and he died in our place. He rose in our place and through him we have victory over sin, death, the devil, and hell. And We thank you, Father, that we have the hope of eternal life. Lord, we praise you that we're here this morning together. Would you continue to be with us in this service? In Jesus' name, amen. So as the title suggests, there are essentially two parts to this passage uh, there, are, there is what the people do and what the Lord does. And so our two points for this morning, if you want to write them down, are the people grumble and the Lord gives. And you get this recurrence of the word giving as you come to the end of the passage. So you see lots of grumbling and then you see lots of giving. And so the people grumble and the Lord gives. <clears throat> so let's look first at the people, which is where the text begins. The people Grumble. So here we are again. Uh, as I said, we were going to have a, a few weeks of grumbling. 
Uh, and that's where we were last week. Here we are again with this nasty word, grumbling or complaining. We don't think it's so nasty when we're doing it. But when we come to see it for what it is. And by the way, the scriptures define reality. right? The, the Bible tells us what things are and how serious things are. And so we're, we're meant to, to see it through the scriptures. And when we come to see it in Scripture, we see its nastiness, this grumbling and complaining. One commentator, Walter Kaiser, gives a helpful definition of the Hebrew word. He says that it is to express, <clears throat> just think about all the, uh, the, the words used here, to express resentment, dissatisfaction, anger, or complaint by grumbling in half-muted tones of hostile opposition. Well, that's not good. When, when you read it that way, when you see it that way, you, you won't say, I, I'm just a little irritable, right? I'm just a little irritable. I'm a little fussy. I didn't get much sleep last night or whatever. And we tend to do that. We minimize our sin. Uh, but when we think about it in those terms, we see it for what it is. There are two places in the Bible where we get a concentration of this word grumbling. We get it here in these chapters in Exodus, verses 15 to 17. And then we get it after Numbers 10 when the people leave Mount Sinai. So, so as they're headed to Mount Sinai and when they leave Mount Sinai. And that's going to tell us that the history of Israel is not going to be very pretty. It's just letting us know, it's giving us a preview of where things are Headed. And even embedded in this is the, is the knowledge of the need for a Savior. It's the knowledge of the need for one who will not grumble, who will not disobey, who will not, like a sheep, go his own way. Who will, like the time of the judges, do what is right in his own eyes. But one who will completely follow God's law, the need for a redeemer. When we think about this grumbling that we see here, it reminds us of the fall. Grumbling brings us all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. It, begin, it takes us all the way back to the beginning of human history. And it reminds us of the fall in two ways. First, it takes us back to the attitude of Cain when the Lord did not receive his offering. Now remember, Genesis 4 is so illustrative because we get the description of the fall in Genesis 3. But I think we're meant to see the ugliness of the fall in Genesis 4. It just doesn't take time. It's not an evolutionary model. It's not as though it sort of starts out simple and gets more complex or whatever. It, it, it simply just falls apart at the very beginning. And you see the most atrocious acts with Adam and Eve's children, with Cain. But before the murder of his brother Abel, we see what is in his heart. Genesis 4, verses 4 to 5. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And I think we're meant to understand here a kind of murmuring disposition, a grumbling disposition, a complaining disposition. This is the attitude or the posture of heart of one who is grumbling. So it takes us all the way back to the fall with Cain, but really I think we can understand it even <coughs> in the heart of Adam and Eve. Because what is it that Satan tempts Eve to do? If you carefully read Satan's temptation of Eve, what you see is that he tempts her to doubt God's goodness. And to doubt God's goodness, however it manifests itself, is a little form of complaining. Or we could say a full-blown form of complaining and grumbling. So it takes us back to the fall in that way. Second, it takes us back to our earliest days as human beings. All of us in this room, at one point, was sitting in a high chair. All of us in this room, at one point, was crying out from a crib. We are taken back 
to our earliest days as human beings. This is what we see in small children, as cute and precious as they are. We see this lived out, not just on the pages of Scripture at the beginning of the Bible, but we see it lived out in the flesh at the beginning of life. Complaining, fussing, throwing fits because things are not going their way. This is across the board. This is everywhere. We see it in our homes. I have many young families here, and we get to see this often. Hopefully we are disciplining it and watching it carefully, but we see it. And the sad thing is that it doesn't leave us as we get older. It's not just in the high chair or the crib or the bumbo or whatever. It's not just there. It stays. And probably you see it most in traffic, but you see it all over the place. It stays with us. It just morphs. It changes form, and we could say it gets uglier and more destructive. This is in our fallen nature. Complaining is an expression of our inadamness. It is simply what we do. It is part of our DNA, as it were. But here's what we recognize this morning. As we're gathered here as believers, we're gathered here as Christians to worship the Lord who saved us, we recognize that as Christians, we must rejoice that we are now in Christ. So part of Paul's point in Romans 5 in particular is to explain to us that we, are, we have moved from being in Adam to being in Christ. We are now in Christ. And in Christ, by the Spirit, we find the reversal of this tendency to grumble, this tendency to complain, which is part and parcel of what it is for us to be in Adam going all the way back to the beginning of human history and all the way back to the beginning of any particular biography. We see this in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Things like joy. Joy and grumbling, those are on different sides. Peace. Peace and grumbling, they just don't hang out together. Joy, peace, and this word Patience. Three, the fruit of the Spirit. There we see specifically related to the idea of complaining or grumbling. Instead of grumbling, instead of complaining, in Adam we have joy and peace and patience in Christ. This is part of what it means for us to be Christians. It is natural in every way for the unbeliever to complain. How sad when we do it. Those who have joy, peace, and patience flooding our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But we know the flesh is still active within us. We recognize that. We recognize that though we are in Christ, we carry our mortal bodies. That, that though we delight in the law of God in our inner being, we recognize that we still do with our members, including our murmuring tongues, and our thoughts, we still do that which is more in Adam than in Christ. And so we recognize that we must, fly, we must fight and we must flee. That there's a battle to be waged against the flesh. We cannot simply sit here and go, I am in Christ. Yes, period. There we go. We take delight in that truth. And we recognize that we have a new principle within us, that the life of God is within us. But then we look to Scripture and we recognize that we still have quite a fight to fight as we wage war against our flesh, as we put on the whole armor of God that Christ himself purchased for us and himself put within us, that we fight daily against all the fruit of inadamness. And we do it in Christ. This morning, as we watch the Israelites in this passage, I think we can make four observations about grumbling. So here they are, four observations, if you would like to write these down. Just from 
the verses at the beginning of this chapter. So here they are. It forgets blessings. It spreads to others. It distorts reality. And it attacks God's character. I'll say those again. It forgets blessings. It spreads to others. It distorts reality. And it attacks God's character. So let's look at each of those. First, it forgets blessings. Look at verse 1 with me. <clears throat> they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. Where have the people just come from? Where have the people just come from? What have they just experience. They were thirsty and God gave them drink. Temporary relief followed by abundant relief at an oasis. They've just come from an oasis. Do you get that? It's so important when you read that word, Elam, that you're not just, oh, a Bible name, Bible place, and it just goes right over your head. You got to go back to verse 27 and you got to, what is Elam? It's an oasis. They've just come from an oasis and they are grumbling. Against the Lord. Even more, that oasis was filled with symbolism, 12 springs and 70 palm trees, reminding them of God's faithfulness for centuries. Even in the midst of their slavery. And yet here the people act as though God has done nothing for them. It's almost as though the entire history is erased. This is absolute memory loss. How quickly they have forgotten God's past works. And you know what's even more remarkable about this? You don't just have to go back to that, to that word Elam, but you also recognize the calendar. If we understand this to be the 15th day of the second month and we realize they left on the 15th day of the first month, guess what? They're only one month in. One month ago. They saw the Lord pass through Egypt and destroy the firstborn. One month ago, they witnessed God bring all of them. They experienced, they were part of it as God brought them out of Egypt. They're only one month in. We're not talking about, man, it's been decades. This is just so awful. When is the Lord going to show up? We're talking about one month. One month. And it hasn't been any time since they left Elam, the oasis. We need to understand this morning that complaining is an act of forgetting. When you are complaining, you are forgetting God's blessings. All that God has done. And we think about it with a financial blessing. As you just think about God working in our lives financially. It, it happens that God will do something in our lives financially and, and will be, it, it'll, it'll bring us happiness and it'll do this or that situation for us. It'll make things easier for us. And then it just doesn't take long before we say, but this thing over here. Or maybe it's a health issue. Maybe God brought you through an incredible bout of sickness. And then you get something which is just analogous to a runny nose. And all of a sudden, we're just grumbling against the Lord. And he's brought us through something massive and now something small. We forget. And when we complain, it is as though we are erasing all of God's past faithfulness. Hopefully we see the seriousness of it. Second, it spreads to others. Look at verse 2. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Here I want you to see who is doing the grumbling. It is the whole congregation of the people of Israel. But as we know, it never starts that way, right? I remember taking sociology in college and thought it was pretty interesting, but recognizing that when, we, when you study sociology or when you study groups or whatever, you recognize that it's always a group of individuals. Always gets traced back to individuals. Systems don't sin. 
people sin. Individuals are sinners. So we see here the congregation, the whole congregation, but it never starts that way. Grumbling begins not in a mass of people, in unison, but in individual hearts. It begins there and then spreads abroad. It starts in the heart and then it takes over groups. It takes over masses of people. And here we have a mass of people who collectively and individually are lost in complaining. You know, we've seen this in our own lives. Think about it. The effect that our complaining has on others. It's not just us. It's not just what's going on inside of us. But the way that it spreads to other people. It's not just a matter of our own personal sin. It is also a matter of how we are polluting our various spheres of life. Think about that. Everywhere we go, we bring these things with us. And as we complain, we are not just housing that within. It's not, it's not just a personal problem. It's spreading out and influencing others. It's influencing our children. It's influencing our small groups, influencing our church, influencing our families, our extended families. We grumble, we complain, and it spreads into all the spheres of our lives. Think about it in our homes as parents. You know, one of the ways that I think our children see the Lord at work in us is that we're not grumbling about our circumstances, but we're trusting the Lord. What are we saying to our children when we're going through the trials of our lives and we're just like, oh, this is terrible, or whatever else? We're saying to them that we don't trust God. We're saying to them that we're not happy in God. We're saying to them that really what matters is the circumstances in my life, and as long as God can make those good, I'll worship him. But if those aren't good, I don't know. I'll go through the motions, but I'm still going to complain. This is to live like a pagan. It is to live like Cain. It is to live in Adam. How are we influencing others with our grumbling? Third, it distorts reality. Look at verse 3. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we... This is, this is incredible. This is appalling. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Really? Is this what it was like to live in Egypt? Really? What about all the oppression and brutal slavery? What about the death of their children at the time of Moses' birth? What about all their suffering? What about the cruelty of Pharaoh? What about the hopelessness for the future for their children? No. All of that reality has been distorted. The present crisis has been so inflated. And by the way, Satan is really good at inflating the present crisis. Oh, it's so bad. It's so heavy. Just erases everything else. Everything else just falls away, crumbles away. The present crisis becomes massive. The present crisis of lack of food has led them to twist the past. All of a sudden... Egyptian slavery is sounding like the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey. Or with meat and bread. This is ridiculous. This is totally untrue. And it is incredible what they say here. They would rather have been struck down by the hand of the Lord in the plagues where at least they had food. So instead of saving them for this hungry day, God should have just killed them with the Egyptians while they were stuffing their faces with meat and bread. That would have been better. The Lord could have just taken us out, taken our firstborn, given us boils. That would have been better. Instead of saving them, God should have killed them. This is a twisted view 
of reality. And it is part of what's happening when we complain. Think about that. We need to see this because it happens in our complaining too. We twist reality. It was so nice then, but now it's terrible, Lord. What are you doing? Fourth, it attacks God's character. Our complaining attacks God's character. Look at what Moses says in verses 7 to 8. He has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Who are the people grumbling against? It's not Moses, because guess what? Moses isn't the one who brought them into the wilderness. He's not the one who has led them here. It is the Lord. It is Yahweh. Their complaint is against Yahweh. It is an attack on his character. They are attacking God's character, the one who brought them to this situation. Attacking his wisdom, his goodness, his kindness and care. Complaining always attacks God's character because God is the one who is leading us through life. He's the one who's in control of the circumstances that you're facing right now. Grumbling attacks him. Now let me me say this to us. Think about this. When we consider this to be true, we will begin to see complaining. Now catch this. More in the category of blasphemy than in the category of grumpiness. You see the difference? We like to put it over here. I'm just grumpy. When we see it for what it is, according to God's word, when we watch it unfold here, we recognize that complaining is more tantamount to blasphemy than it is grumpiness. But we would rather confess grumpiness, right? Maybe you even did that this morning during confession of sin. We wonder why things don't change in our lives, and here's why. Because we're not actually confessing sin. We're confessing a little watered-down version of our sin. We're confessing a lie. We're confessing something that pats us on the head and makes us feel more comfortable in our sin, and that's why we keep doing it. It's because we're not confessing actual sin and repenting of actual sin for what it is according to the Lord. More like blasphemy than like grumpiness. We minimize it, and that's why we perpetuate it. Well, that brings us to our second point this morning, and that is the Lord gives. We see that the people grumble, and now we see, praise God, that the Lord gives. As we saw last week, God's patience and grace towards his people is utterly astounding. It it really is. In fact, the focus of this passage is not really on the grumbling, as we'll, we'll see that as we continue forward. Though we must take note of it and apply it to ourselves, it is significant. This is one of the major parts of the Bible that deal with grumbling. The focus of the passage is on God's provision. They grumble and he gives. They complain and he cares for them. Human grumbling is met with divine grace. And, you know, I I confess this for sure. We have seen this in our own lives. How God will meet our grumbling with further care. It, it, It amazes us. I mean, there have been times where I have complained and grumbled and I thought, oh man, the Lord's discipline on me is going to be fierce. I mean, he's going to just flatten me. I really messed up there. I was so selfish and so ungrateful. And he doesn't. He lifts me up. He encourages me. He grants me mercy. That is what the Lord does. Meets our grumbling with further care. It is humbling and it is convicting. That's the amazing thing about it is when the Lord does that, when we do something and he does not give us the discipline we deserve, it's convicting. Well, I don't want to do anything against you again, Lord. 
I don't want to sin against you again. I don't want to do that anymore. You're so good. You're so gracious. You're so kind. Let God's care and patience and grace in the midst of our sin and grumbling in particular, push us towards repentance. Now listen to this, people of God. Push us towards repentance rather than presumption. Because there's another response to God's kindness and His grace and His long-suffering, and that is we continue. We presume on His grace. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or do You presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness, listen to this, is meant to lead you to repentance. So listen. Yes, God is being kind to us because he's our father. Yes, God is being kind to us because he cares for us. Yes, he's being kind to us in Christ because he sees us through Christ. But listen to the language here. There's a purpose for God's kindness when he doesn't give you the discipline that he could give you. It is that you might repent. It's never that you might say, oh, thanks, God. And then you just keep doing it. You just keep doing it and keep confessing. And it just perpetuates and continues and continues. That is to presume on God's grace. And it is grievous. It is grievous. Not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Let me just ask you this morning, where where does that leave you? Maybe there's... Something in your life where you've seen that repeatedly. God has met your sin with great patience. But instead of that patience bringing you to a place of great conviction and and humbling you and, and leading you away from your sin, you're just in this habit of continuing to do it. Presuming on the Lord's grace. Turn from that this morning. Turn from that. It is wicked. And what we will see next week is that this provision comes with a test of obedience. God will design the provision in such a way that it tests his people's adherence to his commands. So first, there's a description of what's about to happen. and we're gonna, A lot of what we're about to read is repetitious, so we're going to go through this somewhat quickly. But look at verses 4 to 12, taken as a whole, as we look at God's gracious giving to his people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And that's, we're going to talk about more of that next week. So I'm going to hold off on that because that's, the details of that are going to be borne out next week. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening... You shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord." Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. It really is striking how many times the word grumbling appears in this passage. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So what will God do? He will rain bread from heaven repeatedly. Day after day in the morning, quail will cover the land that evening. Some specific instructions are given, but as I said, we'll give more attention to these uh, as we come to the latter half of chapter 16. God will test his people through this provision. And notice that God's testing his people through them being hungry, but God is also going to test his people when they're full. Think about that. It's not just in those hungry and thirsty moments of life where God is testing us. And we might tend to think that. You know, I just went through a really rough test. You know, God, I went through that time of lack, whatever kind of lack it is. And now there's fullness, whatever kind of fullness that is. 
And we're out of testing now. No. God is testing us in all kinds of situations in life. Through plenty and through lack. Notice what Moses and Aaron say to the people. When God provides for them, they will know that it is the Lord who brought them out of the land of Egypt. Verse 6. And they will see the glory of the Lord. Verse 7. I think that these are basically two ways of saying the same thing. They will know the Lord. How? Through his giving food to eat. Quail in the evening and bread in the morning. God will faithfully provide for his people. He will mercifully and graciously and patiently provide for his people. And in this provision they will know him. And I think this tells us that we know the Lord... And see his glory as we consider what he has done for us. And what he has provided for us. This tells, how do we grow in our knowledge of the Lord? By considering, by reading, by studying what he has done for us in Christ. That is the way in which we come to know the Lord. Moses says, you will know the Lord. When he provides for you in this way. When he shows you that he's present with you. And he's bringing you through. And we will know the Lord more and more increasingly. We will, as Trey preached a couple of weeks ago, we will know Christ more and more as we consider what he has done for us, as the word of Christ dwells in us us richly. So as you're now maybe falling off of your Bible reading plan, let me just kind of pick you back up and consider that that is the way you will grow in your knowledge of the Lord. As you consider the arc of Scripture, as you consider the story of Scripture and what God has done for us in Christ. And what has God provided for us? The answer is bread from heaven. How? John chapter 6 makes that clear. Verses 32 to 33, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus Christ is our bread. He is what the Father has provided for us that we might live and that we might be nourished through our lives unto glory. And as we read here, God manifests his presence and his glory through the cloud and the people are gathered together before him. And as we read in verse 12, God will provide for them for a particular purpose. Look at what it says in verse 12. I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them at twilight, You shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. You know, after God does something wonderful for us, we need to stop. And we need to extol who the Lord is. We need to extol the Lord. We need to lift him up. Because the purpose for everything God does in our lives is that we would know that he is the Lord. Right, we just go, I, I, how many times it's happened to me where you pray about something, God actually, he does it. You pray about something very specific and God does it. We just thought, oh, that's great. We're happy about it. We're excited. We don't even pray. We don't even thank him. We, we, don't even, we don't even recognize that through all of that, the whole purpose was that we might know him better. And there's not even a conversation about the matter. The purpose is that we might know That he is the Lord, our God. And give him praise. Verses 13 to 15 give us a description of what God gives. And I'll just read this briefly. In the evening, quail came, came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake like thing. Fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. See the glory of the Lord. He has been faithful. He has provided. He's met your grumbling with his grace. Look at what he has done. This is the manna that the Israelites will eat for the next 40 years. The name manna coming from the question, what is it? We will talk more about this substance next week, but for now we need to see its miraculous nature. The Israelites don't recognize it. It's interesting to read some of the natural explanations that this is a secretion of some kind of lice, some some kind of bug, 
Well, I guess that'd be Laos, wouldn't it? Uh, there's a there's the secretion of some sort of bug feeding on tamarisk trees, and that secretion uh, can have a flake-like appearance, and that's what the Israelites found, and so on and so forth. I mean, you get these sorts of natural explanations, but the Israelites don't recognize this. This is clearly a miracle. It is something they have not encountered before, and it is something that is regulated, as we'll see. So this is not just a, a natural secretion or some sort of thing found in nature. This is something that God miraculously provides, and as we'll see, it is to be kept in a jar and put in the ark for future generations to remember the glory of the Lord and his faithfulness and his care. It is, as the Lord said, bread from heaven. That's exactly what it is. And as we close this morning, we rejoice that God has provided for us the true bread from heaven. And keep this in mind. What this story is pointing to all along is what Jesus said, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that word is about Christ. We feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And our Lord's Supper, which we're going to celebrate in a moment, is a picture of that feeding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this demonstration from your word of your great love for your people. God, how much you are so long-suffering with us in our failures. How merciful and patient you are with your children. Father, would that not lead us to presumption? Would it lead us to repentance? Would the kindness of God lead us to repentance? To turn from those things which we know are sinful and which we ought not to do, but which we continue to do. Father, be merciful to us, your people, this morning. Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who feeds us forever. We thank you that those who come to him will not hunger or thirst, but live eternally in your presence with all that we could ever, ever need. Thank you that he is sufficient for us and that he is a food and a drink that does not run out. It does not leave us thirsty or hungry, but sustains us for eternity. We praise you this day in Jesus' name. Amen.